do do no 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 strap hello everybody take your seats welcome to the blue board tavern and uh, hey bonner hi how are you i'm good it's been a while Ah, Dorothea, I see you're back coming in the again. tavern. Ah, Dorothea. Back here we are. Together again. <laughs> and I think Tom and Earl are on their way looking for parking places. Um, and I, to all our guests here at your tables, I just want to remind you, you can chat amongst yourself. Just at your table, there's a chat button right down there. So you can listen in with us or you can talk amongst yourselves and um, you can even pass notes to our little group here using the Q&A button at your table. So um, can't guarantee we'll get to everything, but um, Earl, Tom, hey, how are you Good guys? Good to see you. Happy to be here. Very well, thank you. Earl looks younger every time I see him on the screen. <laughs> I've been well, on a, I've been on a hot trail lately and uh, written been writing so I, I feel robust today. <laughs> writing about <laughs> Shakespeare and Oxford or yes, or Hamlet's thing? book. What is the identity of, of the writer of Hamlet's book? Uh, because there was an article in the Oxfordian, and um, I'm responding to that. And I also had a chance to review uh, a book uh, John Hamill wrote on the secret sex scandals of Shakespeare. <laughs> so, so that was uh, maybe I'm. Lush because uh, of the second <laughs> and John's book. wonderful book. Hot stuff. Okay. Well, uh, let's just leap right in. You order your beverages. Um, but it, as we know, Italy's been in the air because, and well, since we last met, I've seen a couple things that put it in my mind, and I'll just throw them out. Like last night on PBS, they had a special. Shakespeare's tomb, which was, I think, was from 2016, about investigating the Stratford tomb, and they showed the buildings and things. And a while ago, I watched, finally, Kenneth Branagh's All is True, about the last days of Shakespeare, and I thought it was well made, uh, if I could suspend my disbelief a lot. Um, but what, one thing I really got from both of these shows is that Stratford was really small <laughs> it looked like i think they recreated it well in the brana film but it looked really small and mucky and ignorant and that got me thinking how could somebody from there who knew only that in small mucky london and the road in between become obsessed with italy and then go back to that small mucky ignorant place because he was a genius jonathan Okay, show's over. <laughs> That's it. That's the answer to everything. So I want to hear what you guys think about that. And I know Bonner, you knew Richard Rowe and his daughter who put his book together, which is literally the book on Shakespeare in Italy. Dorothy, you yes. literally followed in Richard Rowe's footsteps. So I, I don't uh, have much to say except to sit back and let you guys get into Shakespeare in Italy. You know, it's, uh, I had written to an, or emailed to Hillary uh, Rowe Metternich, who I have to share with y'all. She died about a year ago now, and it's just sad, sad loss, terrible, terrible thing. But, and I had emailed with her because I was writing the review of, of Dick Rowe's book for the Oxford the, uh, newsletter, and I wanted to know the backstory of the book. And I, so I asked her if she had what sort of comments she could tell me and share, if anything, any good anecdotes. And she had quite a number of, of interesting things to say that may, may be worth people or worthwhile for people to know about that uh, her dad and her mom went with them and, and another couple would usually go on their trips and she knows the five trips that they made so all of this information that she gathered came from five trips that she knows about and but when the day began he would have all, all contacted ahead of the people in, in Italy he tracked down whoever the local uh, authorities were on the history the local historians and he would set up to go to the museums or archives or wherever he, he was going to be. But then he would leave them after breakfast and disappear for the day. And they wouldn't know where he was. And he, then he would magically turn up at, at cocktail hour at the end of the day. But he was always very secretive about where he was going and what he was doing, and, which I think is funny. And Hillary wrote that they thought it was hilarious. So <laughs> at any rate, uh, but you, one, of the, one of her Bonner, comments. What, Bonner, could you tell us a little bit about for the people who don't know about the book, who Richard oh. Rowe was and what he did. Oh, um, they, I would. I thought everybody in our in I our neck of the woods in our group. 
knows about uh, Shakespeare's Guide to Italy. I think it's been, I know it's been selling well. I think this is essential reading for. And if anybody does, it's it's can be ordered from, uh, of course, on Amazon. Um, one of the things is that the really str- has stayed with me is Hillary was had, would say, you know, why was my dad with his armies of Shakespeare scholars and authorities and English professors? Why is it my dad the first one to go and do all this? You know, <laughs> you think they've had a few generations and centuries for some to go check things out. But uh, what was so fun about this book, and she emailed me that because when I first was talking to her about it, she was she just had the private printing out that was done and she had a big party. They had a party for her dad and you gave the private printing of this is now the Harper Collins printing. But she was telling me that she was fully expecting to have the usual long slog of the process and the and the rejections and she'd send it here and yawn and get rejected. And it didn't happen. She'd sent it one of the first, uh, the, I don't know who was the very first, but she sent it to Harper Collins. And very quickly, they got back to her. They said, we've never seen a book like this. We want it. <laughs> no. You know, but why have they never seen a book like this? Because nobody's never done this before. But at any rate, she well, didn't have be- the long, hard, painful, uh-huh. and discouraging process to go through. It just happened so quickly. Well, like we've said before, is the whole Stratfordian idea just shuts doors so nobody bothered to look because obviously Shakespeare didn't know anything about Italy. So why bother? Because, he, because everything he wrote was a mistake. <laughs> right? He didn't know because anything about it. So it's perfectly clear that, that, you know, you can only sail around Italy. You can't sail through it. <laughs> right? Until somebody found out you could. <laughs> A lot of people knew that you could. They're called Italians. <laughs> Maybe they should have asked them over all these years. <laughs> I want to call your attention. I had not read it in a while. Another wonderful, wonderful article is in the Shakespeare Authorship Coalition book, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, question, question mark. It's by Alexander Waugh. And it's one of the best articles I've ever re- read about the mistakes. He's just tearing them up for it. <laughs> and one of the things that he says, he says, it's the article, the, it's chapter seven. And there are other, uh, Earl has a wonderful article in, in this as well. Uh, it's called Keeping Shakespeare Out oh, yeah. of Italy. And he writes, insisting that Shakespeare filled his Italian plays with imaginary detail is a risky business, as it could often and easily be shown that he did not. <laughs> that he did not just use imagination all over the place. The stuff's really there. And also all these errors. All these errors are not. Turns out Shakespeare was right. Also, yeah, you know, there, are, there are as many plays set in Italy as there are in England in the canon. Yeah, well, oh, exactly. He seemed to have a great preference for Italy. Very, very um, large. With, it was the only happen. play set in contemporaneous England, of course, as we all know, is Mary Wise of Windsor. And everything, the, of course, the historical plays are, but they're historical plays. So, And of course, the documentation of the Stratford guy, there's no reference to Italy or an interest in Italy mm-hmm. or at all. Or him leaving the country ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So should Look we at start? the literary references, uh, the untranslated Italian works like uh, uh, Boccaccio, Bandello, Ariosto, Cintio, Ser Giovanni, I think. Uh, oh, and uh, Dante. Yeah. I mean, all the resources he had access to. Now, we know the Earl of Oxford was fluent in Italian. And we have Orazio's Quaco's testimony to that effect. And uh, the better part of a year in Italy, certainly, you know, he was well accomplished in French, Italian and Latin. We know that. So he loved the Italian literature. And, you know, Ernesto Grillo says that four fifths of all the English romances that were that were dramatized during Shakespeare's era came from Italian plots and characters and techniques and all that. So from a literary standpoint, uh, the whoever wrote the Shakespeare works loved Italy. Well, and that's one thing. It's such a big topic to cover in our little time here, because it's not just Italy, the country. He had a familiarity with the place, but he had familiarity with the language and with the literature and with the theater. Right. And the whole culture. It wasn't just like traveling through a place and seeing it. He, so where do you first. want to begin? So Dorothea. Where do you want to begin? Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to throw in a, a defense of, of Shakespeare here because 
I mean, he, he talked to sailors in bars and he looked in books and he must have found maps somewhere. I mean, what's wrong with that? He talked to that guy, John Florio, I'm sure. Ah. Yeah, who was, as far as Stratfordians know, the only living person in England who could read and speak Italian. Because his mom, you know, his dad was Italian, his mom was English, but he was born in England, but he learned Italian from his family. And therefore, John Florio wrote or translated everything. That's yeah. another thing you should know, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'll take my tongue out of my cheek right now. And um, <laughs> why doesn't somebody jump in now? With some real facts? <laughs> well, if you're talking about literary sources and the way the new historicists have handled this over the last 40 years or so, they invented a whole language just to describe what they can't describe in terms of direct literary sources because of the problem with untranslated sources. So they talk about the cultural transmission of archetypal narratives, you know, and they create a, you know, a whole language around how things are translated and, and transmitted across international borders and arrives mysteriously because it's culturally based. It's not about a particular source. Classical philology is out. It's an elephant's graveyard of literary studies, according to, you know, so they divorce any association with direct textual sources in order to create a, a obfuscated uh, dismemberment of the author. So his intention is no longer important. It's about the cultural in influences that that have this. So they take the background and make it the foreground. Brian Vickers, you know, calls it a cultural crime. And uh, he refers to new historicism as new anecdotalism where they historicize an anecdote in its utterly ridiculous extent. I mean, Stephen Greenblatt, excuse me, one last thing on Shylock, says, oh, the, you know, um, satirical commentaries by Solerio, Solanio, Graziano in the play. Well, that came from Shakespeare's actually watching the hanging of Dr. Lopez and the crowd laughed inappropriately when Lopez claimed he, he still loved the queen. So he takes this moment of historical laughter, and th that explains why Shakespeare put satire in uh, Merchant of Venice. I mean, they go way off the rails on this. And so it, it, it is a response, I think, an intellectual response to the challenge of those Italian sources and the French sources, the Greek sources, other sources like that. But they create a whole language of cultural transmission that eliminates the need to actually identify a specific source or a specific intention of, of a specific author. So it's like the total opposite of what Occam's razor, that the yeah. obvious answer is this <laughs> is this, is he knew it because he was there, is they have to create this whole... Finally, the, the worst offender is a guy named Graham Holderness, a professor and an editor in England, a very, very highly respected. He says, trust me, if you let the work of the imagination work on this, you're going to come up with something that's reliable and probably truthful, you know. I mean, he says, trust me, but he has no basis upon which. In his book on Shakespeare and Venice, it's a 250-page book, doesn't have one description of a, of a source for Merchant of Venice. He doesn't mention any of the Italian or the English sources for that play. So you know that they're they're intentionally divorcing uh, classical philological interpretation, which is the basis of a lot of Oxfordian analyses, and saying, oh no, it, it was diffuse, it was in the bars, of course. So, and this is really the reason nobody had ever gone to Italy to check it out in a couple hundred years because they had decided all this first, so. Honor, could you talk a little more about Richard Rowe and his tech, what, what he did to write his book? He was a lawyer, right? Well, he was a lawyer, and uh, his and I get this from from Hillary because I was mostly uh, corresponding with her. Um, it was my pleasure to to fly over to California and give. Uh, Dick was in very very weak and fragile condition, and he was given the Oxfordian of the Year award. And it was going to be presented at the Ashland Conference, but Hillary emailed me back and said she didn't think her father was going to make it. And I don't, but at any rate, uh, so I went, got on an airplane and, and flew and, with, and had, the had the plaque, which I gave him. And we went to where he and Jane were living in this beautiful, beautiful retirement community called the Garden Villas or something. And uh, he was in a wheelchair by this point, but uh, it was just really, his eyes filled with tears and he was getting the recognition. He, he, he had richly deserved <laughs> and for a long time. Uh, the process, according to Hillary, had taken him about 20 years between yeah. the trips. And 
it was it was a little bit upsetting to her because well she had been living her husband was in the diplomatic corps uh, Mr. Cornelius Metternich and so they mostly lived abroad and whenever she'd come back to visit her father he said I just got one chapter to go I'm on my last chapter well he was on his last chapter for year after year after year and finally uh, after her husband retired and they got, bought a, pl a place to live in Pasadena so she could be near to them she said, oh, God, I, she realized it was the ball was at her court to move this thing forward and get him past the last chapter. And so she kind of took it over. And one thing she did is she she calls it that she uh, tweaked the, his prose a little bit around the edges. And she really didn't want him to know when he saw the final book. But basically, she hired a secretary to help to help with working. Mm -hmm. She hired a map a person because he had a lot of maps of things that he wanted in the book that you could see that they, she had an artist to take him out of his head and put them in the book. It was a, it was a huge labor of love on her part. And uh, it, it did come about. And by the, before he died, he did know that Harper Collins, that his book was going to be published by a major uh, publishing house. And so it was really, and he was Oxfordian of the year, which was, of course, more than well deserved. And basically, he did the common sense thing of going to Italy and with Shakespeare's works and checking things out to make sure if they were accurate or not, right? And I and, and uh, what is amazing, and I'm going to turn this over to Dorothea, because she has been exploring this with even more things than he found going to Italy and as building and building on this fabulous foundation that we have inherited from him and this his labors. So uh, at any rate, Dorothea, do you want to go now? Sure. I'm, I'm yeah. going to try something new here. I'm going to try to share my screen so you guys are let me know if this works. You mean you're uh, going to show us what's on your phone right now? Uh, okay. Well, I can flip it around and show <laughs> you. Hopefully, I'll be able to make that happen. Um, I just <laughs> wanted you guys to take a look at a 1576 map. I couldn't find a 1575 map. Um, so this is Oxford's second year. And the purpose of showing it, if you haven't seen this before, is that many people are confused about the historical and political situation in Italy at the time that Oxford was there. Italy did not exist as a country. Italy was not united into a country until 1861. That's Garibaldi. Uh, and it was quite a task. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years, it was fiefdoms. If you think of uh, strong guys who um, each had their own area. Of course, the Pope had Rome and the Papal States, but the Republic of Venice was actually very large. And you can see that it extends down the edge of the Dalmatian coast to the Duchy of Milan. So Venice is independent, but the Duchy of Milan, for example, was in Oxford's time underneath the jurisdiction of, uh, uh, of, of, of the Holy Roman Emperor. And so that and all of Naples was strongly Catholic and papal. Sicily uh, was um, certainly an island. It is the largest island in the Mediterranean. Its history has Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Normans who have come through. It is the breadbasket uh, that feeds so much of Italy and actually so much of, of Europe. But even if you look at some of these tiny little places, you'll see um, Montferrat is a really tiny, tiny spot. Um, uh, if you look up into the, into the corners of Northern Italy, you'll see that there's Genoa. So this was not like, oh, I'm going to Italy and I can traipse here and there. Oxford, as you may recall, said he feared to go basically even pass by Milan. And the reason for that was that he was very concerned that the Spanish um, would not take kindly to a Protestant Englishman there. Um, if you've seen the video that I uh, of this talk that I did about my most my most uh, difficult adversary. It's a man I've been married to for over 30 years. <laughs> my husband, Rich, was very much a confirmed Stratfordian. Um, Rich has a number of impressive degrees. He was a history major at Princeton. He went to Harvard Law School and he has a master's in history from the University of Edinburgh. And his position is the name on the book, unless it is 
uh, basically either pulled back or that there is disagreement about it during the person's lifetime or immediately thereafter. From a historian's point of view, that is the author and the burden to say it is someone else is quite high indeed. And we suffer with this, you know, all the time. Um, so I, I decided that in order to convince him after 30 years of arguing, <laughs> we needed an Italian vacation. Now we've been to Italy many times, but we had not gone through it exactly this way. So I took Rose book and I said, let's find out if he's right. You know, I don't know. And we went from Milan. We just did the Northern part on our first two trips. It took us two trips all the way through from Milan to Venice. And then we did on another trip, we did Sicily. We have some other work to do in the middle of Italy. But in doing that, I went with a sort of trust row, but verify. And I found some additional things that he didn't mention. I also found some things that I went, gee, I can't locate what he found. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, one of his most out on the limb places is the wonderful uh, historic little town called Savagnetta, mm -hmm. which one of the Gonzagas, um, a very cruel Gonzaga, a man who beat his own 14 year old son to death, charming individual, uh, fashioned to, to his idea of what the art should be. And one of the things that Roe said he ran across was a group that was touring in Italian. And he didn't speak Italian, but his wife did. I do speak, read Italian, which is very useful. And he said uh, there was a clue given that the Duke's Oak was actually the main portal. Well, I found I didn't find that because there wasn't a tour and no one mentioned it. Uh -huh. I can't say he's wrong, but I also can't say he's right. Um, on the other hand, I did notice that on a pedestal in the center of the main piazza in Sabanietta uh, is a statue of Athena, which uh, that Gonzaga's father brought from the sack of Rome. And she had been there since 1527. Ooh. I mean, it's like 30 foot high. I was getting kind of depressed because Rich was going, yeah. Sabanetta, yeah, really? The site for Midsummer Night's Dream, yeah, really? You know, I'm going, well, you know, it's got all these references to Italy. There's this dance from Bergamo. It's it's got there's its ancient Greek references. I think he's just like transporting this place into Athens so he can talk about England. Uh, and Rich is going right. And then I found Athena sitting on the statue, uh, the statue of Athena sitting on this column. And that was like, wow, it really is. And then I could go into the internet. And I said, there's got to be something there. And I come out with Little Athens on the current contemporary 20, you know, 21st century um, shield for the city of Sabanetta. So there is definitely something to Little Athens on the Po. Um, you know, Roe may very well be right about Sabanetta. I think it's more likely than not that he is. What did you convince uh, your husband? That's what we all want to know. Well, you know, you got, you kind of, I want you to go back and watch the video. Did I convince him? I would <laughs> say I got him halfway, you know, he's, he's going to want, he's going to want that smoking gun. And I said, okay, I can't give you the plays in Oxford's hand, but I can't give them to you in Will of Stratford's hand either. <laughs> if Will of Stratford had a hand, yeah. if indeed he could, you know, he could sign. So he agreed after that, that trip that it, the pile of circumstantial evidence is really so high that it's statistically impossible. For well, did, I know it's been going around. Some of you have seen uh, someone named Patrick Sullivan. Patrick Sullivan. Did that attempt at a spreadsheet. He did. The probability of Shakespeare and he should like nail it on the door of the birthplace trust or something like that. Yeah. If but someone's, someone's got we, it. Any, uh, post before it. we get to that, any thoughts, anyone else? Tom or Earl on Sabinetta or because that's a, that town is the thing that always sticks with me of it from his book the most is how just basically on a day off from his research, he stumbled across a place called Little Athens with the Duke's Oak being a city gate rather than a big tree. And there's a church there called the church or the temple. Yeah, it's it's actually that um, I couldn't prove that either being there. 
Uh-huh. Although I did go on some Italian blog sites, Sabanietta blog sites, and I found that the residents of Sabanietta um, call it Il Tempio di Coronata. So Tempio may mean chiesa in the local dialect, or it may be that it is built on the um, foundations of a Roman temple because the town was originally okay. a Roman town. So I couldn't find it there, but you know, you've got these sort of these threads and threads and threads that if they're calling it Tempio, which means tempo and Chiesa means church. So you would think it was Church of the Incoronata, but it's Tempio del Incoronata. Uh, okay, okay. I heard that from another table. Somebody says Sabinetta is the clincher of clinchers for me. Uh, Somebody it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful spot. Um, and people live there. Um, it's also a major you know, tourists from walk through, but there are in, in that part of Italy, it's certainly not alone in being one of these walled fortress towns. There are many of them and you can drive through them. And some of them are large enough like Villa Franca, which uh, is outside Verona, which Roe also mentions as a judicial center for Verona um, as, and, and in the play Romeo and Juliet, you know, come to old Freetown, our, our common justice place is what Aeschylus says as he's chastising the uh, um, Montagues and, and Capulets for street fighting. But it's enormous. If it's possible for me to tell you, if you could take four English castles, plus their sort of closes, you could put them inside Villafranca di Verona. It's that large. Well, what this all really says is um, if you don't get, I think, Oxford we're talking about, you're missing the plays because, as somebody pointed out, maybe when they do productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream and have the characters meeting at the Duke's Oak and they put a big tree on stage, they're getting it wrong because it refers to a city gate, which makes more sense as let's meet at the city gate, which leads out into the forest mm-hmm. to practice rather than meet under a big tree. And you wouldn't know that if you hadn't known like Oxford had seemingly passed within 25 miles of this little town. We know that. Yeah. Well, what, have you, what have you got, Bonner? What have you got? This, oh, uh, yes. Uh, it, yeah, this is the Duke's, uh, this is the picture in, Ro- in Rose book of what he, of the, of the entrance. That, sorry, it keeps disappearing on me. I guess I'm magic too. But uh, it, it's on page of his book, 184. And this is the, what he, this, this, Structure. I don't know if it was all original or not, but this is the structure that's now known as the Duke's Oak. Well, let's say the the guide. I guess the guide said that. Uh-huh. Yeah, to okay. to him. Oh, right. while while he was there, right? Yeah. Um, so, Earl. It's not marked. Like Remind if you go, it's not. Earl. Really. I see wheels turning, Earl. Oh well, I'm thinking of other churches besides the one in Sabionet, and I'm thinking particularly of the. Church of Santa Maria Formosa in Venice. And we know Oxford was around Venice for the better part of a year. And uh, the other people who we met at that church are very, I think, fantastic in terms of the understanding of the authorship situation. Of course, he also went to the Greek church where the liturgy was in Greek. And so we know that he at least was familiar with the liturgy of, you know, the, that was expressed in that recently constructed beautiful Greek church there. But the Santa Maria Formosa church also is the place where uh, Veronica Franco went, the most famous female poet of that era, and her residence was in that neighborhood. So very likely that he would have met her at that church. That's also where he met Orazio Quaco, the page he brought back to England, who spent 11 months with him, and uh, then testified afterwards that Oxford was very open-minded about religious practices and that he was a real gentleman, had introduced him to the court, had sung for the queen. All this is in testimony that was in the Venetian Inquisition. And the other party that was in that church is a guy by the name of Gaspar Ribeiro, his son, his daughter, Violante, and her suitor, who are the characters that stand in for Shylock, Jessica, and Lorenzo in The Merchant of Venice. Uh, Gaspar Ribeiro was written about by a scholar by the name of Brian Pullen, and his original research goes back 40 years. He's published a whole series in books and in articles about the role that Ribeiro played in that church. And his and his identity as a person, a very suspect model 
for for Shylock. He was a converso. He was a Murano from Portugal, but very rich. He had the meat monopoly in in and of course there's three references to the cost of meat. You know, Shylock said, "What's a, what's a human flesh worth? It's no more than beef or chicken or goat." And then Jessica is you know teasing with Gabo, and Gabo says to her that you know you're driving up the price of pork by converting Christians. So th th that's referenced three times. But he had that, but he had he was a money lender. He had a three thousand ducat loan, just like you know Antonio required. Uh, he, got, he got sued for usury. Uh, he was mean spirited. He was old. He was probably a bit demented at the end of his life. He was, you know, later convicted by for apostasy for still being a secretly practicing Jew, even though he was pretending to be a Christian. Is he so, the one his daughter yeah. ran off with? Someone? Yes, his daughter Violante ran out, and married a Christian, and when he got busted by the, by, the, and... by the court, when he was indicted by the court, Lorenzo, I mean uh, Lorenzo, his his uh, his son in law ran to the residence and stole two thousand ducats worth of jewelry and money. So the whole scenario, the subplot of Jessica and Shylock and, and you know, Lorenzo all come from people Oxford met in church in Venice when he was there. That was going on during that time. And I wrote this up in 2011, since Shakespeare Matters in the summer issue. Yeah. It was a lot of fun doing that research because it, 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 it to yeah. me, the closest topicality you can imagine. You know, Il Pecorone also has, uh, I mean, Giovanni Fiorentini's Il Pecorone, which he wrote in like late 14th century, but didn't get published till, um, I would say right around, I think 10 years after Oxford was born, um, roughly. I mean, that story, uh, which was not translated into English until um, after Oxford and Shakespeare were dead, but that story has in it, the pound of flesh, right. the caskets, the merchant helping a younger relative, which is exactly the relationship between um, Antonio and Bassanio, and uh, a Jewish lender and a rich lady in Belmont. So if you take the story set uh, that's set by an Italian writer and you pair it with knowing a specific individual and you see the connections between it. You've got a Jew who's a money lender. It's about Venice. You can see how the whole thing from a writer's point of view almost writes itself. That, that brings up a good point. I just got a note here from Ken at another table and he says, uh, talking about the Italian sources, uh, what books in Italian Oxford might have had access to? Do, you, do we know the contents <laughs> of his library? Of I can tell you. Or his friends? I can tell uh, you. Oh, God. Um, where, many, where did he get these books? Many. Um, I, Oxford was probably purchasing them. I mean, he learned his Italian before he left, right? And like all the rest of us, you speak it better when you're there. Uh, clearly, Dante. There is a tremendous book out there, um, which is called Images from an Antique Book, which I have somewhere, uh, which is by um, a woman called Vivian Robertson. And uh, I think Patrick Sullivan, I think, reviewed it, I believe. Uh, anyway, Vivian was writing her PhD dissertation, and she believed, although most scholars say there's not that much in Dante, uh, that shows up in Shakespeare, she believed that there was. And the reason the book is so interesting, she does, she's not an Oxfordian, is that she comes this close. She asks the questions, how did this happen? And then she gives an answer, but she's like missing the thread. I mean, she's got everybody that's related to Oxford all linked together, but it's this big hole in the donut. Uh, nevertheless, um, you know, certainly there are so many, there aren't as many references to Dante. Dante, of course, is not written in Italian. Dante is written in Tuscan vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, I have read all three, Hell, Purgatory, and Paradiso with an Italian professor going from the Tuscan into Italian. It is very difficult, even for native Italian speakers. I got better, but I could not have done it without her. Her name is Annalise Brody. And Professor, I thank you. Um, Robertson came up with just phrases, and I came up with some others where you can, she said there, you know, the word in skied, which meaning put into heaven, is comes from Dante. 
um, a description of Lear's eyes as being, you know, that gems that comes from Dante. Um, there's a wonderful line called that Dante wrote, which is La Virtue Che e Piove, which is virtue or mercy that comes from the rain. Well, I don't have to tell you where that line showed up, right? The quality well, apparently, of mercy, it's not the same, but it's the these beautiful phrases that if you don't go through an English translation, you can really see. The connection. You know, hmm. So Shakespeare must have been a linguistic genius. Um, clearly, because even if you say, even if you were a native Italian speaker, vernacular Tuscan is, is quite a challenge. Um, number two on my hit parade, which there are a few references, but it's really technique teacher is Petrarch. So the thing about Petrarch that's so striking is that he wrote in many different genres as Oxford wrote in many different genres. He wrote to cure his own melancholy and depression over loss and anxiety about someone he cared for very much. And he said that if, if the words that he writes are read by somebody after his death, then there will be a breath that passes from one human being to the next. He wrote a series of sonnets over the loss of a woman he loved very much. His name is associated um, with sonnets. I mean, that's exactly right. The meter is is one that, you know, Oxford used. And I, I always think about, you know, the dark night of the soul for Oxford, 1601 to 1603, whether you believe that Southampton was his son, which I do, or whether you believe that he was his lover, as other people do, or whether you don't have an opinion and think he was just a close friend. You have to think of the anxiety, as Hank Winnemore wrote, you know, very eloquently uh, in in the living record, um, how much stress that man was under. And what he did is he wrote sonnets about it. And that is Petrarch. Um, so he was actually emulating an Italian. Absolutely. So Petrarch was like a, a technique teacher. You know, this is how you get over it. This is how you do it. Petrarch said that his process of writing his sonnets was to take letters and writings of ancients as guides and to work himself out of the depression. And the terrors of his age included plague, which Oxford also had. We know a little more about that now than we used to. We've lived through it to some degree, although one third of our citizens did not die as they did in Petrarch's Florence. Um, civil unrest, certainly there was a lot of that at the end of the queen's life uh, and, and that sort of terror and loss. So uh, Petrarch has some little phrases. He has phrases like, he calls death the doubtful journey, which has a little echo in Hamlet. Um, he calls his spirit a barca, a little boat that passes uh, sort of down, you know, like Prospero and uh, Miranda passing in a little bark down the Pavese Canal to the Tyrrhenian Sea and so forth. Um, going through the others pretty quickly, Boccaccio, a very strong feminist. You know, there's a lot of questions. Where does Oxford get his feminism? I will tell you that Boccaccio is number one on the list uh, for that, the stories from Boccaccio, Il Decan, um, 10 times 10 stories that Decameron show up uh, in a folio published by Jaggard in 1620 and dedicated to Susan Devere's husband. Um, it's a situation where I think, you know, this was a something that's possible her father had written for her. Just and it goes back. Yeah, just a coincidence. I'm the initials IF. Everyone thinks it's John Florio. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Um, Cymbeline, I could go through, you know, what the references are, but you guys probably know them. It's obvious. Uh, yeah, well, Shakespeare I mean, was in Italy, in Romeo Italy. and Juliet, there's a consumption of a powder in Boccaccio uh, that makes one appear dead and a character is buried, believing that they are dead. All's well and ends well. Um, it, it's like almost textbook uh, from Boccaccio. The King of France has a fistula and a young woman who is the daughter of a 
doctor cures him. In return, she asks for the hand of a man who doesn't want to marry her. He buries her, but he goes to Florence. In Florence, he wants to woo another woman. She uh, gets the woman to switch places with her. She gets a ring. She gets pregnant. And, you know, it's it's the same storyline. And that is uh, the third day night story in Boccaccio. Uh, the balcony from Romeo and Juliet, the non-existent balcony, the one that's not in the play. I found it. <laughs> it's in Boccaccio, where a couple... The, uh, the Romeo character, I don't remember his name. It's not Romeo. He scales her father's walls that are hard to climb and high. And they make love on the balcony. And unlike Romeo and Juliet, the parents then want them to get married. That's the point of the story. But there's the balcony. Fiorentini, we talked about Ariosto is huge. Orlando Furioso is all through the canon. Tasso, which I haven't read yet, but I'm getting to. Um, Cynthia, we talked about. So and these Tassi, are all, yeah. all sources that mm -hmm. Shakespeare is known to have yep. used that somehow. Right. So if Will is, if, and, and some of them were partially translated, some of them were in Latin, the Dante parts of the Dante were in Latin. If Will of Stratford could read Latin, he would have gotten some of the stories, but not all of them. And some of the specific phrases and certain. And the specific phrases from the Italian, it would depend how they were translated into English. I mean, the chances just go down and down and down and down and down on the volume. What do you guys think on this? Any thoughts running through your heads? Honor? Uh, just, just one little thought to comment. It's so I totally love everything Dorothy is saying. It's just incredible. Great. You know, first of all, Dorothy, you're delving into this so deeply and it's so wonderful. And with you, what you're doing with the Italian sources and Elizabeth Wagman is doing with the French sources that have never been recognized and never no. obviously appreciated because for what they are, because the because the the great ones out there, that army of scholars, they mm -hmm. want to keep Shakespeare out of Italy and out of France. They don't want to look at these things that are just in your face. But uh, so, I mean, I just love what you're doing. You're just opening up new worlds for everything. Well, Elizabeth Wagaman, Elizabeth Wagaman is my inspiration and my heroine because she is she is awesome. On I'm sure that's very quite we, mutual. I, we, but I just wanted to point out that in the Court of Wards, and I know most everybody knows this, uh, it's listed a, about half a dozen listings that were ordered for Oxford when he was still a ward of, of William Cecil Ward. But well, Burley wasn't Lord Burley yet, but when he was at Cecil House on the Strand. And it was, of course, Plutarch's Lives in French and books in Italian, but they don't say what they were. But we do know that he was be or, or and getting those books from wherever they were in Europe uh, was no mean feat. This book, this idea that, and of course, Earl was elucid elucidating, oh, that's, huh, I'm not getting the word I want there, but telling us about it very clearly about how the, the problem of getting these extremely expensive, valuable books, they didn't just sprout wings and fly. And, oh, Amazon. Uh, and <laughs> Amazon. Course, they, the, the great ones, have you believed that, the, that they just, that the print just went off uh, into the, the atmosphere and sort of floated over culturally and then just rained down. <laughs> and Madam Strafford just held out his hands and suddenly it, he had translations of all these things. Like Actually, thing. William yeah. Ceres, that's the -E -E is what you find in the uh, biographies that, that uh, uh, Burley had a professional person who, who uh, an agent who went over there and got him the books in his, that were supposed to be a fabulous library. Uh, so, um, and of course, Mildred had books in of the medis of the Greek uh, medis books in Greek on the medical terms, and Earl's written about that. So we could go into that. Thank you, Earl, for something. You know, you know, you've got we your vistas that you've opened we up were, for us too. We were at the Folger Shakespeare Library in 2011 when we had our conference there. I went to the Folger and we saw the Geneva Bible and other major documents of the Earl of Oxford. And one of the most beautiful books he had in there was like a 1540 something edition of the Historia d'Italia with his emblem on it, the, the boar on the emblem on the cover of that. And, and of course, we know recently that Ben August purchased his Herodotus. So and that was the Italian translation from the Greek. So we know the Earl of Oxford collected Italian editions in, in the original language. And that's such an exciting 
thing to think about that uh, the the cultural phenomenon of Shakespeare's Italy has caused such a disturbance that it actually caused the invention of new historicism, among other forces. <laughs> but I think this is a primary one because of the discrepancy. You know, Sam Schoenbaum talks about the vertiginous distance between the sublime of the works and it's right. and always <laughs> wonderful in a ta- you know international you know vernacular canon and the and the you know prosaic you know unimportance of the biography it's just another incredible coincidence that shakespeare was yeah. fascinated by italy and so was the earl of oxford so was you uh, I a little, and uh, actually rereading alexander waugh's r- wonderful article that i read a good many years ago with a with a uh, shakespeare authorship coalition book but uh, he he goes on and and there's something that it's never really been stated that we could really focus on more is is all the all the that you see in the plays for the Italian things that Dorothy is going into even more and more than than Dick Rowe did, but you really absolutely had to be fluid in Italian to be able to do this. There's that's just sort of should be well established. And because he talks about how could he have even moved around Italy without being fluid in Italian to go to all these places and pick up on all these things. Yeah, the, the other thing I think I'd just like to mention for people who are, you know, thinking about Italy, even today, every native Italian born in Italy is born and raised bilingual, mm-hmm. standard mm-hmm. Italian, which today is Florentine Italian. It was not in Oxford's time. There was actually a Paduan Italian, and Petrarch wrote in that, which is <laughs> different than Dante's Italian, but they are also fluent in their dialect. And these dialects are micro-sized. They are for my people, my friends, my town, my family. And it is literally impossible for a Venetian to understand a Paduan dialect (laughs) and vice versa. And yet when Italians are in their home or they're with their school buddies, they are speaking even in Rome, where Roman families may say there is no dialect in Rome, there is a Roman dialect and the teens use it when they talk. And so the concept that our man from Stratford could pick up an Italian book, which would be written in a different version of Italian, it's not standardized. Literally, that's one of the things that bringing Italy together, one of the things they needed to do was find a common language. And they and settled one thing, one thing it didn't um, Shakespeare seem aware of some different dialects, like he said, one speaks in a more nasal tone than another region. But I guess he learned that from a sailor. So I just want a little note came up here. Somebody's just wondering where they can see your video, Dorothea. Is it on? Oh, the, it's on uh, YouTube. The Shakespeare Oxford Fellow. Oh uh, yeah, I think you, I think you can get to it. You can either put my name in on YouTube. Or I think you may be able to go through the Shakespeare Oxford website. Um, the name of it is the first thing we do is convince all the lawyers. <laughs> and a little shy, I hear little rumors or buzzing through the word uh, through the room, just mentioning the name Michael Delahoyd and his research that he's done with the fellowship. And so let's give him a, our little standing ovation here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he's here somewhere. Um, I want to I I go back in, in our last minute, if we can, Bonner, sorry. I'll let you jump I have in. a question. Something okay. never occurred to me till I started prepping for this and, okay. and going over all of Richard Rose things and looking at the lovely spreadsheet. And I never, and this is something Earl is going to be able to maybe uh, explain to me too, but I did never realize this because I, I don't have a PhD in comparative literature of, of English Renaissance writers who were writing plays. So what has occurred to me is that Shakespeare, whoever he was, and we're pretty sure we know, we know, but he was moving his characters around like crazy. They're moving all over the place in Italy. They're moving here, they're moving there, Verona to Milan to Florence to, you know, they're going all over. The, and is there, and so this is a question because I don't know the answer to, but does, and I know that, that because I remember Earl gave a talk about the three unities and Shakespeare didn't really follow the three unities because he really couldn't, if he's going to be moving people around. It takes a day, but it takes time for Portia to get out of Belmont and get 
to Venice so she can take over the courtroom. You know, all the, but they're constantly in motion. People are coming and going. And so here's my question. Looking at the other playwrights of, of you know, looking at John Marston, looking at later Ben Johnson and, and the different playwrights who were Christopher Marlowe, of course, uh, did they really move their characters, cast of characters around like this? Is there this much motion in yeah, these other playwrights? Good. And other people do, do I the same did. Thing. I what? can tell you who did. I can tell you who did. Ariosto. Ah, but Orlando Curioso has been of Shakespeare. Mapped. Orlando okay. Curioso has been mapped online because there are so, it is such an epic and there are so many characters. It goes from China to Arabia to Scotland. There's a whole section on how dreadful the Scots are to their women. It is hard to be a woman <laughs> anywhere, but especially here, Ariosto writes about Scotland. Now he's not writing about Scotland. He's writing about Italy, right? Mm -hmm. They are in France. They are in Germany. They are in the Netherlands. They are among the English. It, literally the maps are like little tiny tracks. I think that's- so we know that that Arias, uh, so Orlando Curioso, I'm Curioso, yeah. to be getting my words quite right right now. More wine, more and, wine. And I, and I guess I need another glass of wine to get <laughs> sorted out here. But this is a source and an inspiration. But we're, but I'm thinking of we're looking at Diana Price's chart, for example, where she lays out the other leading playwrights and poets and magnetic playwrights. Do any of them, and maybe Tom would know this because Tom has acted in so much, but does any other English playwright move their cast around, and characters around that like like Shakespeare does? To, no, not that I'm, not I don't that think so, of, but I don't really, I'm not uh, seeped in this uh, knowledge to know that. So that's just something. And granted, Shakespeare, what you've just said, Dorothea, now gives some more insight into it all because he's pulling from these other writers, but that's not, English. I'm talking to you, but the other English writer playwrights aren't doing it. They're more, is this right, Earl? Are they, are the others following more of those good old Aristotelian unities, three? Well, unities? I, I, I think when know. you do the history plays and you compress, you know, 10 years of histor historical events <laughs> into, a, a, you know, a five act play, you have to compress things and things get moved around a lot more. I suppose that's really true of the history plays, but I'm not aware of any other comparative uh, value in that. No, I, I think, it, I think the plot really drives it. I mean, Pericles is all over the place. How many, how many different ge geographical places does he go? And yet with Hamlet, you're pretty much at Elsinore as a little side trip to England that he talks about, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's very little change of venue. It's all in, it compressed into one one experience. So I think it depends on the narrative you want to write. We're, get, we're getting it close to closing time here. And I want to address oh. one thing to give us all ammunition here for the things we always hear about Shakespeare made these errors about Italy. And I know this is a perfect transition because one of them is about all the travel within Italy is, oh, he's so stupid. He had somebody take a boat from this inland place to this inland. <laughs> and, oh, he, to get from this place to this place, he started off in the opposite direction, idiot. Um, can we talk about canals here for a moment? We can, we can talk about canals. Uh, I mean, actually, I, the first thing I wanted to see when I was in Milan, you know, to see if Roe was right. I mean, I had no reason to distrust him, but I had no reason to trust him. Uh -huh. it, it does sound very strange because when we fly into Milan or take the train into Milan today, it is a landlocked. But no, of course, 1575 Milan had an outer beltway canal, an inner beltway canal and three or four major canals. So I dragged Rich in the sun, um, sort of northeast out at the center of Milan, he will remember this walk. It was long. We were tired on a road called Via Melchiori Gioia because I had read in Rome that the Martesana Canal, which is a huge canal completed in 1573 from the east, that is from Verona, right, was actually built through to Milan. And I had heard that it was still above ground at a point maybe a mile and a half or two miles out. Yeah. And we walked it and you get to it. And I promise you, it is there. It is very broad. You can take a boat on it today. It has a path for walking on it and also biking. 
and it it's like a waterfall. It comes towards Milan and then it drops. And there's this waterfall effect and there's a gate, like a grilled gate, and it goes under the street we had just walked on. <laughs> so the canals are there. If you go on to anything you like, um, Pinterest, I have a collection of pictures there on old Milan, but also just, you know, Milan canals. You can come up with so many photos from the 20s <laughs> before they were paved over mm -hmm. uh, of canals in Milan, all of Northern Italy, everybody who had money traveled by boat. Isabella de Est was not going to Venice on an ox cart. So Shakespeare was right again. In the Absolutely right. Absolutely. I mean, De Bonner, I think you said once you saw a map or we're looking uh, for you know, you I, that let me the see canal system can... was like a spider web. Yeah, it was like a spider yeah. web. Oh my. I've lost it. Let's see. I've got some. I don't know if I can find it. Okay. Well, here's the map that uh, yeah. this oh, map. Okay. I'll give credit to John Lewandowski, who used his, who had his assistant, who was a, a from Italy, but was studying in Princeton, I think, at the time. But in fact, interestingly enough, up here, this le top left, that's the River Adige, and and uh, Verona is on the River Adige. So to get, but Milan would be way over here. Much far, far west of where this, this this is east and far, far west. But to get there, you take the river and he has this particular uh, taking uh, an arm of the river Adige. Then you take a canal down to the river Tar Tartara and then you go over again on this river and then you take another canal down. And when you get then you get to the to the mighty Po River and at the Po River, then you sweep this way. and You sweep all the way up back to Milan and that's how they do it. So Shakespeare so, was right that you started off in the opposite direction, right? Where you were heading. Yes. Isn't that how, interesting? How would he know that? How would he know that? Is it born contrary? <laughs> well, obviously from sailors in in the tavern. Mm. But but then the sailors had to if they if the Stratford man found that out, the sailors would have to be bilingual. Which I doubt then, 400 years ago, like Darcy says, they're, they're teaching people now to be more bilingual and, and speak many languages, probably. But I, I would doubt seriously, 400 years ago, people in Italian sp spoke their particular dialect of wherever the area they were from. And people in France spoke French. And you basically, the language of, of diplomacy was Latin. Absolutely. So, you know, how is this How is this man? I have to always laugh when I think about it. Uh, James Shapiro, in his book, Contested Will, he starts to explain how his guy could do, manage all these things. And he did it simply through, through uh, he observed human nature. He chatted with, with tavern people, people in taverns, and he browsed through the bookseller stalls at the churchyards. And actually, there was a reviewer, and I forgot the name, he's an important reviewer in the Wall Street Journal. And after James Shapiro's book came out, he said he was going over and giving giving him a great review and, and of course, kind of putting down anybody who would dare to doubt James Shapiro's book. But he says, you know, the people who doubt this really have a point. I really don't see anybody chatting and observing and browsing their way to writing Hamlet and King Lear and Macbeth and, and whatever. And I had to laugh. I've got that review stashed away somewhere. But yeah, you're really browsing and observing. I think they can't even <laughs> buy their own bologna. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're much more likely to find a plot worthy of pursuing at the Blue Boar Tavern than at the Mermaid oh. back in the <laughs> I was going to say, you know, if Willis Stratford could only have joined us here, he would have learned it all. <laughs> As, uh, Jonathan, um, it's possible you've been passed several notes which we haven't talked yeah, about. Good point. Is it possible to preserve those notes so I, we can, I can let people I can throw out a, a few here. Um, uh, let's see, Sonia, is there any trace of Oxford contacting Cardano to present him his English consoliatione? Pronunciation know. sucks, but um, any. I don't know. Yeah. He, he, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> What's the scholar? He did go to Germany, to Strasbourg. To, to what's the great German Sturmius. scholar? Sturmius. To see Sturmius. Sturmius. Yeah, right. Sturmius. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. So we know Oxford was actually seeking out intellectuals during his travels. 
He yes. wasn't just being a party boy there, like some right. people claim. Um, somebody wonders, um, John Florio's First Fruits, 1578, has been mentioned as a possible source for Shakespeare's Italian. Any thoughts on that in our last minute or so? Um, I guess not. Um, sorry, Ken. Um, and somebody asked how we found Dorothea's video, but I think we addressed that. So those are the notes I've collected here. Thanks. And and Bonna has I have something. a closing yeah, let's statement. Closing. If yeah. there's time, if you've got about 30 seconds. Go for it. Go for it, it comes, I'm quoting Charlton Ogburn. It's in his wonderful book, Mysterious William Shakespeare. And to me, it's the greatest quote I've ever re run across. He says, the Stratford theory must have more lives than a dozen cats to trip fatally on so many facts <laughs> and yet still greet us at our doorstep whenever we look. <laughs> hey, I so we're doing our best to get rid of that cat. <laughs> I just want to put in put in one one quick word. I don't think we have time to show it, but I do want to say that Patrick Sullivan did this incredible analysis of the statistical probability of whether or not Will of Stratford could have heard of these things online. I don't know if we have a chance to see it. Here's just a brief look go. at it. Oh, but gosh. He, oh. He, if you scroll down through it, he went play by play, item by item that Roe pointed out. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came down, as you scroll through it, you will see he very generously gave you know high marks to the probability that any one fact would be heard in the Mermaid Tavern or from a sailor <laughs> uh, versus in the far col column, you know, would you have uh, heard it um, uh, if you were there or learned it for yourself if you were there? And and this to me, it's it's like the difference between with circumstantial evidence, you know, one piece of circumstantial evidence at ah, two pieces, three pieces, four, four pieces. But by the time you roll through Patrick's analysis as a lawyer, I just see so many pieces of circumstantial evidence that are impossible unless you have been there. And that actually was what convinced my husband, Rich, at the end of the day, that the circumstantial evidence, he's done it mathematically. Thank yeah, you, Patrick. I hope, I hope that can be made available somehow, somewhere, someday. Yes. Any final thoughts, Earl or Tom? I've got to kick you out in a second. Um, there is a book I thought, right. you could think about getting it if you're going to go to Venice and, and try to do a dick row of Venice. It's called Shakespeare in Venice, Exploring the City with Shylock and Othello, originally published about 10 years ago, but it's still available online. So if you're planning a trip to Italy, I do recommend this book that actually mentions a lot of the things that we may have talked about a little bit tonight. So it's a it's a more honest uh, uh, than the Ashgate series that I mentioned earlier that are all wrapped up in new historicism and claptrap. So <laughs> good luck with your reading friends, uh, oh, you know, and thank you, Tom. Dorothea, for oh. sharing so much of what your recent research has been. It's been just great knowing that you're on the ground literally and in the library yep to you I, 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 so, sorry i'll mean to interrupt but i'm left wanting more i just wonder <laughs> if at some point we might do another blue ball on italy i just throw that out there but there is so much i think that we haven't touched on still. so much there is so 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 much yeah. it's a very deep pool and somebody, as, on a final wrap-up, is wondering if there's a link to that spreadsheet. I don't think it's 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 circulated in manuscript among us, but hasn't. Been <laughs> um, but hopefully, can, somebody will find a way to put that we, up somewhere. We can do that. We can easily do that, Jonathan. Yeah. All right. I got to kick you all out. But thank all you right. so much, everybody. Thank you, thank everybody. you so much, everyone who came in. Bye. Bye bye. Ooh. Hi. So. Oh, you came to help with the dishes and clean up, huh? We've got a lot of stuff here. and Oh, oh, you're not here to volunteer to help. Uh, but you want to learn more about how you can support the Blue Boar Tavern. Okay, that is good. Uh, the best way is there's a like and subscribe button there by the door. So on your way out, just be sure to press those. Another thing you can do is you can uh, actually go to our website, the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship org, and that will show you tons of new information, uh, things you may not know, whether you're a brand new person, have been with us for years, essays, video links, past Blue War Tavern episodes, 
it's all there. If you're not a member already, you can sign up. Uh, if you're not ready to sign up, at least get on our email list uh, to get all the latest email news from the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. And that will include monthly links to the Blue Boar Tavern so you can participate live by passing us notes and asking us questions and uh, generally joining in. So uh, thanks for joining us. I better get to work. There's a lot of dishes back there. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Like and subscribe. Bye-bye.